Well, we welcome you, welcome you, welcome you to the fifth annual City of Seattle Unity Day, the celebration of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. My name is Isaiah Anderson, Jr., and I am, uh, again, truly honored to be the MC for this wonderful, wonderful event. We welcome you all. We have a wonderful night, and we're going to be honored by having the Native Drum Group in ceremonial prayer. I'm a Chante wa ste na pe chuza pelo waki on wanata na machi apelo ia wo slaha amata ha yelo tukashi la wakanta ka petukile wo pila tanka ate wa yaki Charles Remley ina wa yaki Donna Harrison unchi wa yaki Dorothy Naha Dorothy Harrison Remley le mi chingchi ayelo chante tadashi Na mita wichungi Rebecca, na michingshi chetan. Well, good evening. My English name is Matt Remley. My Lakota name is Wakia Wa'anatan. We're a Honk Papa Lakota from Standing Rock, but I uh, live here in Seattle in Beacon Hill. Uh, so my wife and my kids. And uh, thank you, Marta and the committee for asking us to come back and share a song. Uh, this song we uh, decided to sing tonight is uh, a it talks about giving thanks. Uh, we ask um, in times of difficulty, we, we ask for help from those uh, around us. And <clears throat> even though we have difficulties in life, uh, we give thanks to life because it's a beautiful thing. So that's what this song talks about. <clears throat> This uh, next young person I'm about to bring up, I am honored to call her uh, one of Seattle's and the country's next star. Um, she is a member of the Teen Summer Musical. She's a gifted individual, and she's going to sing the national anthem. If you deem it fit and are comfortable with doing so, please stand for the national anthem. So proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad 
broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly Amen. Amen. Um, well, we have another young person from the Teen Summer Musical, another star of tomorrow, coming to join us, and he is going to sing the Black National Anthem. And so I am going to ask you to stand to your feet right now and put your hands together for Mr. Trenton Walker. has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day begun let us march on till victory yeah. is won. Thank you. There's another hand for that young man. That was beautiful. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, was supposed to be Cecile Hansen up here, and uh, unfortunately couldn't make it. Uh, but Marta pulled me aside and asked if I'd come back. And uh, Lakota people were matriarchal, so when uh, women ask us to do something, we're obliged to do it. So I am up here again. <laughs> I'm going to uh, say the prayer in our uh, Lakota language uh, first. Um, and we feel that's really important because uh, from the late 1800s all the way until 1978, uh, our ceremonies, our languages, our spirituality was criminalized uh, in this country. And it wasn't until the passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of uh, late 78, 79. And I'm, I was born in 77, so when I was born, our, our uh, speaking this way and these songs even earlier were still uh, criminalized. So I'm going uh, to just share a little in Lakota, then uh, translate. <clears throat> 
tokashila wakantaka a petukile wopila a petukile woashte yoha lena dwamish makoche gi awami chakiyo dwamish oyate gi awami chakiyo tokashila lena wichasha na wiya hokshila na wichikchila gi awami chakiyo and tokashila wakantaka lena uh, uichasha uya owichakia yo owichakia yo and to kashila martin luther king wopila tanka to kashila and to kashila petukile mini wichoni ki okia yo okia yo to kashila unshila yo unchi maka na ina maka wopila tanka just <clears throat> that translates to uh, just giving thanks to each and every one of you and to your families who you're here uh, representing and ask uh, that each and every one of you is watched over uh, to the youngest and to the oldest that Tokashila uh, Wakantanka blesses your homes and helps you have a good, healthy, good life and give an acknowledgement to the Duwamish lands that we're all uh, here upon and uh, giving thanks to them for allowing us to be here. And uh, lastly, uh, praying for Onchi Makar, our, all of our Grandmother Earth to, to protect her, as well as the, the Mini Wichoni. Uh, a lot of people heard about Mini Wichoni in our fight uh, in that water, that water that's connected uh, to each and every one of us. And uh, that Mini Wichoni don't actually translate to water. What it translates to is it's giving me life. So we're just praying for our water. I'm a taku awesome. We're all related. Thank you. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us here today on this really important evening um, and welcome to the Seattle um, Day of Unity. I want to, before um, uh, I introduce the mayor, I want to just first off thanks, thank a few folks. I want to thank um, our Office of Civil Rights. I want to thank Seattle Public Utilities. I want to thank the Seattle Parks Department. Um, these are the, the departments that really pulled together to help make this happen. I want to give a particular shout out to Jennifer Samuels from Council President Harrell's office. She works really hard at pulling this event together every year. And of course, um, warm and uh, grateful um, uh, honoring and gratitude to our host, the Seattle Baptist Church, First, First Baptist Church. I'm Lisa Herbold. I'm the city council member that represents West Seattle and South Park. That's District 1. Any, any folks here from West Seattle or South Park? All right. Yeah, right on. Hey. <laughs> um, I also chair the committee that has oversight of issues related to civil rights. Um, and so this is a really important event to me every year um, as I reflect on the importance of honoring uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, celebrating his life. And um, when I think about what it means to celebrate the life of Dr. King, what I always come back to is celebrating and honoring his commitment to resistance and to stirring things up. <laughs> Dr. King did not support the status quo. And, and he stirred things up and he resisted and he did so to fight for social change and with the ends of justice in mind. And, um, you know, when I think about the status quo and uh, not being down for the status quo, uh, I think of Mayor Jenny Durkin. Mayor Durkin uh, likes to refer to herself as the impatient mayor. And an impatient mayor um, doesn't always ever s settle for the status quo. And so um, I really uh, appreciate working with her. I appreciate um, her commitment to the issues that bring this community together to be a better and stronger Seattle that represents the needs of all of its residents and shows um, a good example to the rest of the country and can help lead other cities um, towards a more just society. And so with that, come on up and give a big hand to our wonderful mayor. <laughs> I at least get a hug. Yes, you do. Yeah, How are you? Go. <laughs> All right, good evening. Is, I thought you said this was a Baptist church. Let's try that again. Good evening. 
There we go, that's better. Thank you so much. And I want to give, I want those two young people who sing, just stand up one more time if you could. So amazing, so amazing. That's what the face of liberty in the future looks like. Thank you very much. And I got to give Isaiah and the Parks Department, if you haven't seen the Summer Teen Musical before, go. It is, it will change your life. I mean, those young people are amazing. So thank you for doing that here today. It's just great. I'm sorry that uh, uh, Council Member Harrell couldn't be here, but thank you, Council Member Herbold, for those kind words. Uh, Bruce is, is doing uh, two things right now. He's off to pick up the keynote speaker. So he's not only your council president, he's the best Uber driver in all of Seattle. <laughs> Um, and I was sad to hear Bruce say that he would not run for re-election again because he has been such a part of this city for so long. Um, he and I have been friends for a number of years. We not only went to law school together, but our kids went to the same school. So we were on, you know, sidelines of sport events and at teacher events. And uh, I had the good, I never met his dad, um, but I met his mom. And they were themselves a force in the civil rights community here in Seattle in the 60s. And that's what Bruce grew up with, what he was committed to. And it's, I think we're going to miss him in Seattle, but I know that he will stay connected. I'm really sorry. I actually have to leave for a family event this evening, and I'm going to miss Hill Harper, um, which is too bad because not only has he done so much in the space of speaking up for equality and equity and reexamining what the real history of racism has been in America, um, but he is brilliant. Um, he is just one of those people, and I probably shouldn't say it, but I got kind of a big crush on him. Um, and when, when he comes here, you'll see why, because I've seen him on television many a times, and in just uh, he's one of those inspiring people. It's fitting that we are having this service here this evening, um, because in 1912, the First Baptist Church was the, one of the first to stand for the role of faith in justice and peace. And this church has always stood and embraced those values that Dr. Martin Luther King fought for and died for. He was a champion of justice for all of America, for the voiceless and for those who could not fight for justice themselves, he stood. He stood on that bridge. He wrote his letters from the Birmingham jail. He went to Memphis. He fought for it and he died for it. But what they learned is you could kill the man, but you could not kill the dream. Yeah. You could slay him, but you could not slay his ideals, his vision, and his voice. And did we hear that voice here today? And I'm telling you. And in Seattle, we know that we have challenges here and across America. It is a difficult time in America. It is difficult because our national politics sow hatred, division, pure, unadulterated racism, and certain leaders are proud of that. And here in Seattle, we've had a challenge as we've grown so much the city has become unaffordable, and people have been pushed out. Families have been torn apart, and it's harder and harder for people to get a toehold here. And you know that no communities have probably been stronger affected than the African-American community in the city of Seattle. You know, when I was growing up in this city, you know, Mount Zion Church was the heart of what was a large, thriving African-American community. It was almost 70% African-American, and today it's diminished to about 12%. The families are gone, the businesses are gone, but just as you can move the people, you don't move the heart. I had last weekend the opportunity to sit with Africatown and their plans there to reclaim the 23rd corner, to listen to people from the city all across the city that we are a changing city, but we must fight for justice for everyone every day. 
We will not let we will not let our president or anyone else tell us how we should and can be. We will protect our Latino brothers and sisters. We will protect our transgender brothers and sisters. We will fight for the same things that Dr. King fought for to make sure that people have equal access to justice to make sure is that arc bends towards justice, it doesn't always have to bend so slowly, and that we will every day stand up and ask ourselves, not what can government do better, not what can the churches do better, what can each of us do better? What can each of us? And if we do that together, I think we can stand proud. Because there is, while our challenges are great, there is no challenge that is greater than our dreams. There is no challenge that is greater than what we can do together. And there is no challenge greater than this great city. And so I believe that I am one of the luckiest mayors in America. Because I get the chance every day to get up to meet with people like you, to hear the voices like that, to say our children are what matters. We will fight for our children. We will give them free college. We will close the opportunity gap. We will give their parents support. We will give their mothers good prenatal care. We will support the families. And if we do all that, we support each other. Because only if we support each other can we make it. Only if we support each other can we truly hear and listen and act upon the dream that Dr. King painted for each one of us. So let's leave here renewed. Let's listen to music. Let's say amen and hallelujah. We will fight on. So we have a proclamation that the city council passed unanimously and the mayor signed. I know that people want to hear every word of it. OK, maybe not. <laughs> so let me tell you the important parts. That today we are gathered to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day and honor Dr. King's legacy of patriotic leadership in the struggle to secure equal rights for all Americans. And while we have made great progress, we know that significant disparities still exist in our country, our state, and our city. And we must come together to continue to pursue Dr. King's vision for our nation. And the city of Seattle is dedicated to eradicating racial and other systemic inequalities within our institutions and our entire community. And Seattle is a welcoming city for all people. And we stand together with our immigrant and refugee neighbors and friends. And today, we remember Dr. King's words. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And we commit to making our vision of equity, opportunity, and inclusiveness a reality for all. So today is officially declared Martin Luther King Jr. Unity Day. Let us carry it in our hearts and carry it every day this year. Thank you very much. It's absolutely my honor to introduce Hill Harper and say a little bit about him. And I will tell you, Seattle, uh, you are in for a serious treat. Uh, I'm going to tell you, this is a one powerful brother. And I want to talk about him. Uh, in a second, there's a few housekeeping things we want to acknowledge, and that is to put something like this together, 
Um, it takes a lot of volunteers and a lot of city departments. And just if you're from a city department that used your valuable budget because we asked you to, uh, would you just stand so we could acknowledge you, please? If you're here from a city department, please stand, City of Seattle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And one of the things, and Councilman Herbal, thank you very much for introducing the mayor. Like I said, we had a flight delay. It was no uh, fault of Hills, of course. He's stuck on a plane coming out of uh, Los Angeles. And so, uh, but we got here and we're going to have a good time. I also want to say that when we put together uh, events like this, we are very intentional about recycling our dollars into our community. So I happen to party with these brothers every Tuesday night, uh, and they are fabulous. Thank you, John and company. And Precise Catering is one of our favorite catering companies uh, that provide uh, a lot of service to our community. So thank you for being part of what we're doing, Precise, as well. They're, they're awesome. And I see many of you who I know, uh, the NWCP, the, the new and revised is in the house. Thank you for being here, leadership group. So many community activists here. Thank all of you. So a little bit about Hill Harper. Uh, I'm going to lead with what might be the most impressive part, but it really isn't, but I'm going to read it anyway. He graduated magna cum laude with a BA from Brown University. Of course, that's an nice big school, okay? He was valedictorian of his department. <clears throat> he graduated cum laude with a JD, Juris Doctor's degree, from Harvard Law School, and also holds a master's degree with honors from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. So imagine with all of this education, he goes and tells his parents, who are very accomplished in their own right, I'm going to be an actor. Uh, you have to tell us how that came about sometime, because uh, with his educational background, he pretty much had the world open to him. Uh, he met uh, our former president, Obama, as a young man at Harvard, and they, be they became lifelong friends. But that academic background just says two things, really. He's smart, and he works hard. But what are his values? What is, what's in his DNA, his, his, his mental makeup? Well, he's the author of a New York Times bestseller, Letters to a Young Brother, Letters to a Young Sister, and The Conversation. He's the author of Letters to a Young Brother, was named the best book for young adults um, by the American Library Association in 2007. He wrote another book, Letters to an Incarcerated Brother, Encouragement, Hope, and Healing for Inmates and Their Loved Ones. That was published in 2013, and I know a lot of you are doing work on reentry, uh, looking at those that have been unfairly and unjustifiably incarcerated, uh, and this brother has done a lot in that regard as well, as well as voting rights. He's done a lot of work in the voting uh, world, and I'll just sort of describe one of the things he's done. A quote, he said, you know, the right to vote is one of the most precious rights in our democracy. Um, he was the, in 2016, the nation's lawyers committee for civil rights under law, the lawyers committee, the nation's largest nonpartisan voter election protection coalition, was formed in 63 uh, at the request of uh, President JFK, partnered with Mr. Hill Harper, who serves as the national sparks, spokesperson, intricately involved in the organization's work to expand access to and safeguard the right to vote throughout the presidential election cycles. And we know how critical that is in these crazy times. So not only is he talented and smart, but in my humble opinion, he's certainly committed to the kind of things that I know everyone in this room is committed to. Now the fun stuff. He's also known for his roles on The Good Doctor. CSI New York, Limitless. Um, his collective writing and acting work has been recognized with six NAACP Image Awards. And uh, like I said, Hill, we have the local branch uh, here uh, and their board here to uh, honor you and to celebrate. Um, his, uh, if you look at, and it's in the program, if you look at all of the television shows and all of the movies that he's done, you really have to figure out how much energy did this brother have with that kind of academic, academic credential. So, um, he's strong, he's powerful, and I got to tell you, he's made my year in 2019 because I got the opportunity to hold hands with him and pray. So I'm happy. 2019 is going to be a good year for me. <laughs> Seattle, I present you the one and only Hill Harper. Hey, everybody. You know what? 
I'm going to use this. How's everybody doing? You know, that's fantastic. I I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so happy that you're here with me. The uh, uh, Celebrating Dr. King, who happens to be my fraternity brother, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, uh, it is an honor, and it's a wonderful opportunity. And I'll tell you personally, uh, for the past several months, I've, I've made Seattle my home because we shoot The Good Doctor in Vancouver. And my son, who's over there, uh, is in school uh, here in Seattle. And so I drive up to Vancouver to shoot the show. Um, so I've gotten a chance to really kick around the streets. And, and it's wonderful to be here with all you black folks. I now see you on the streets. <laughs> so I, I really, I have no idea where you are, but I'm glad you're here right now. Because I haven't seen you. But I've seen you now, so I know that you exist. It's almost like that, that fish that's way down deep in the ocean that they say exists, but you never quite see it. That's like black Seattle to me. But that's a whole different thing. I play, I play. So let's jump into this real quick, because I know it's, it's a school night. We don't have a ton of time, but we have a lot of serious things to actually cover. And, and, and what, what I want to start with first it's a simple, simple idea. And I want you to say this with me. Say, the truth, the truth is, undefeated. is undefeated. See, the truth is undefeated. You don't have to say that again. Um, <laughs> the truth is undefeated, yet I believe that many of us are not living in our truth. And so I want to kind of unmask that during this talk because I believe if there's someone who represented their truth, their passion, it was Dr. King. And he was willing to die for what he believed in. And when I think about his legacy and I think about, because, you know, fundamentally speaking, this is a celebration of his legacy. Then we have to be honest with ourselves and look in the mirror and ask ourselves individually, are we living our truths? And trust in the fact that the truth is undefeated. So I'm going to use two different Dr. King quotes to sort of break this down. One quote I love and I completely agree with. The other quote I disagree with. And then you can say, Hill Harper, who are you to disagree with a Dr. King quote? We'll tweet about that later because I'm about to disagree. So, check this out. First quote, quote that I love, probably my favorite quote from Dr. King. Dr. King, Dr. King said, we are all tied together in a single garment of mutual destiny. Dr. King said, we are all tied together in a single garment of mutual destiny, which means no matter how well I may be doing in Hollywood, whether The Good Doctor is the number one show or not, if a young brother in South Seattle, South Side Chicago, South Bronx, South Central LA, South Texas is not doing well, then I'm not doing well. Because my destiny is inextricably linked. And just like everyone in this sanctuary, your destiny is inextricably linked with mine and mine to yours. So therefore, if we are seeing social injustices, if we are seeing mass incarceration, if we're seeing police brutality, we are seeing homelessness, which was rampant in this city, then I don't feel so good when I go to my home because I know someone else is, 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 is living out in the rain and the sleep. And I try to explain to my son, when we're driving past the tents, he said, Daddy, what are they doing? I said, they don't have a home. How can we help them? It's unacceptable in a city this prosperous that you have so many tents. It's unacceptable. But see here, the truth is undefeated. Now, I know the mayor left, and maybe she's happy she left. But my point is simply this, and it's not to cast dispersions on anyone, but it's to have us all look at ourselves in the mirror and say, how am I complicit in allowing injustice, social injustice, to happen and continue in a city as prosperous as this city? Okay, because the truth is undefeated. So we have to tell the truth about ourselves and what's going on in our communities. So we are all tied together in a single garment of mutual destiny. 
That's the one I agree with. The one I don't really agree with is one that actually my friend used a great deal during his campaign. He would say this quote, and what's interesting about this quote is that if you do the research, and this is probably why I don't agree with it, is because it's really not a Dr. King quote. Dr. King actually borrowed the analogy from Theodore Parker, who was a theologian in 1853, and he actually wrote this analogy in 1853, and Dr. King borrowed it, and then people ascribe it to Dr. King, but it's really Theodore Parker who said the wrong stuff. <laughs> Do your research. <laughs> so Theodore Parker borrowed from Dr. So Dr. King borrowed this, and Dr. King said, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The mayor said that today? Oh, well, she was wrong. <laughs> because it's not true. It does not bend towards justice. It bends anywhere you decide to bend it. Right now, we're seeing the arc bending towards racism. We're seeing it bend towards this. Listen, you think in Germany during World War II, it was bending towards justice? No. It was being manipulated and bent by people with power and money. And it will bend whatever direction the energy is put to bend it. So, I want to break down the problem that I see. Because if you go along with this idea with me, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends whichever way folks exert the energy to bend it, then you have to believe that energy is important. And I would like to suggest to you that those of us that believe in social justice, in making the world better for more than less, that providing more opportunity and expanded foundations of opportunity, that I believe that we are being out energied Because the truth is undefeated, y'all. Here's the deal. Look at yourself in the mirror and ask who's the loudest in the room, who's the most aggressive in the room. You may do a lot of yoga and meditate, but maybe that's not bending the arc. Watch where I'm going to go with this, y'all. So, Energy is a big deal with me. I talk about it a lot. The reason why I talk about it is because, like, I am sort of, you know, I went to Harvard Law School and, and got my master's from Harvard, but, but, I did, but, but, but I always loved physics. And, you know, I'm no Neil deGrasse Tyson. You can book him next year. But, <laughs> but I'm a pocket physicist. I'm a pastime physicist. And... I talk about rules of physics. In fact, is there a physicist from the University of Washington in the house? Physics professor. I was counting on there being one. <laughs> is there somebody who's dated a physics professor from the University of Washington? Yeah, somebody, no? Okay, I was counting on that too. Okay, this is tough, tough, okay. So here's the deal, you're just gonna have to believe me on this. Energy, or E, in physics is everywhere. You've heard of E equals MC squared, right? It's a, it's, it, it appears everywhere because energy is actually what makes something happen. So there's a, there's, a, there's a law in physics that says to move a mass that is in stasis or unmoving, to move something like, like this mic stand, an equal or greater amount of energy must be applied to move it. So if I don't put enough energy in, I'm not going to move it. But if I actually apply an equal or greater amount, I can move it. Is it am I making sense? Yes. Okay. So if, if that is true, then watch where I'm going, y'all. If that is true, and we want to solve very large, very stuck issues like mass incarceration, like homelessness, like 
the erosion of our public education system. If we want to solve these big problems, what does that tell you? A large amount of energy needs to be applied. But most of us sit back and we'll read about it and we'll talk about the politicians about it. But we'll go about our own business and say, wow, I wish they could do something more. And it's always about they. And the problem is, who is they? The they is us. We are the they. And that's why I believe that we are complicit in living life with too little energy. Now, people say, Hill, I can't live with more energy because, I, you know, I got my, my bills. I got my, my children. You know, some, this one person came up to me and said, I'm in the sandwich generation. I said, I said, what's that? He said, oh, well, you know, I'm of the age where I got to take care of my kids and I got to take care of my aging parents. I'm sandwiched between the two. I got no more energy or resources to devote to anybody else. And I said, you're a lie. And they were like, why, who you gonna call me a lie? And I said, I just called you a lie to your face and you didn't even have enough energy to actually come at me. <laughs> so you're clearly living with too, too little energy. Yet, we're allowing white supremacists to out-energy us. They'll run around and get in your face right now. They'll yell at you, they'll call you names, they'll be upset, yet we just sit back and say, that's a shame. Wow, I can't believe it. We don't come together. We don't organize. We don't take leadership positions and say, you know what? This is unacceptable. I'm actually going to come up with a game plan to stop it. No, we sit back and we say, oh, dang, I wish it wasn't like this. I'm going to pray about it. Ain't nothing wrong with praying because... We just prayed before I came out here because I said, please, what I'm, what I'm about to say, don't let them come at me. I said, Lord, please. But here's the deal. I can sit up here and talk and, and make all of us feel good about who we are and what we're doing. But that's not where we are right now. We need to feel uncomfortable because there are forces at work that are trying to stop you in every area. We just talked about voting rights. There are systematic things being done with people with more energy than you to strip you of your voting rights, to strip you of your power. The fundamental democracy that we have goes back to the ability to vote, yet we are being stripped of it right in front of our eyes. The Voting Rights Act from the 1960s hasn't even been renewed, yet we just allow it to expire. So, we have to start asking the question, why? Why? Have we gotten too comfortable? Are we afraid? Are we complacent? And if that's the case, here's the real rub. If it's true that we're all tied together in a single garment of mutual destiny, and if it's true that young people see what we're doing and they see us coasting through life kind of being complacent and not really being aggressive enough to make a change and we expect them to do something different. So physics tells us something else. Physics tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed. What does that mean? Energy cannot be created. It just simply means that the amount of energy that's necessary to change anything already exists. We're sitting on it. It's called potential energy, yet we waste it every day. You know, I meet so many people that this is how they wake up. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I'm in Seattle. It's raining again. And they look over. Oh, I hate my husband. I hate my job. I hate my boss. I hate my car, no. They don't jump up and say, no, today's the day. I'm actually going to change something. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to raise my amplitude. I'm going to raise my voice. I'm going to actually be aggressive. I'm actually going to go for my passion and my dreams. So many of us are sitting on it, and why do I need you to win personally? Because if you raise your amplitude, you give other people permission to do the same. 
So therefore, if you're doing something you don't love right now, stop doing it. Life is too short. And I'm talking about your job. I'm talking about your relationships. I'm talking about what you care about. I don't judge what you care about as long as it's in service or helping yourself or others, right? It doesn't matter to me. I care that you raise your amplitude in doing it. I care that you get more passionate about it. If you're not passionate about how you're spending your time, stop spending your time that way. It's simply good. The people say, no, Hill, I can't do that. I got bills. I got this. It's, oh, I'm in the church. I can't swear. <laughs> oh, Lord, Lord. Oh, Sometimes there's choice words you got to say to express what you really want to do. You understand? So here's the deal, y'all. I want everybody to take out their, their mobile device. Take, take out your mobile device, please. If you don't have one, come see the president of the city council. He'll buy you one over here. Uh, take out your, your, your mobile device, put it on the photo, put it on photo, and turn the camera towards yourself. <laughs> put it on photo and turn the camera towards yourself like you're taking a selfie. And I want you to look yourself in the eye. Look yourself in the eye. Don't point it towards me. Point it towards yourself. Look yourself in the eye for real now, for real. And say, am I living my truth? Ask yourself that question. Am I living my truth? Say it out loud. One, two, three. Am I living my truth? Okay, look at yourself in the eye and ask yourself this question. Am I living my passion? Am I living my passion? And then ask yourself this question. Have I transferred all my passion to my kids? Don't transfer it to them. That's too big a burden. They want to see you live your passion. So, one more, say one more thing to yourself. The truth is undefeated. So tell the truth to yourself. Stop lying to yourself. I want to talk about something that tells us oftentimes that we are far away from our truth. Because people say, well, how, Hill, how can I do that? How can I get there? And everybody needs a, a methodology or a program. And I'm going to share one with you that's very, that's near and dear to me. And if you've ever read one of my books, you know I talk about this all the time. I believe that we're all active architects of our own life. I believe that we're all active architects of our own life. Is there an architect in the house? Where? Fantastic. I love you. Because I was waiting for someone to help me out. What's your name? Willa. Willa. Oh, I like that name too. So Willa, when an architect sets out to build a structure, what's the first thing that they use before they break ground? What, what would be the very first thing? They have the idea. They know what they want to accomplish. What's the first thing they're going to use, the first tool or, or thing they'll use to build? They'll draw their design. They'll draw it. And what, is, what do you call that? Your plans. Your plans are your blueprint, right? So, so they'll draw it out. And, and tell me this. Why don't we just start building? Why don't we just go? If, we, if I know I want to build a beautiful sanctuary like this, and I know I want all the, all the pews to face up here, and I know I want it to have a, I mean, this is so nice. I want it to have the carved wood and the stained glass. Why don't I just start? Why do I need to draw out a blueprint? Because you have to lay the foundation. You have to build the steps so you know that you're building from the ground up. Right. So, so a different way to say that is if you have a plan, there's some measure of accountability. If you have a plan, there's some measure of accountability because you can always go back to the plan and, you, and, and, and hold yourself accountable because if you start building something that's way off purpose, then at least you can go back and say, you know what, this is off. The pews are facing the wrong direction. Windows are in the wrong place, whatever that is. And what's interesting to me about the way most of us live our lives, and it's not our fault because we haven't been taught this. We haven't been taught it, so I'm not blaming anybody. But the way most of us live our lives is that we would, 
if we hired an architect to build our house, we would ask them for more specificity from them than we ask of ourselves in building our lives. The vast majority of us walk around without an actual blueprint. And those of us that do, where do most people say they keep their blueprint? Right up here, right? But if you hired me to be your architect and I said, don't worry about it, I'm going to build your house. I got you. I got it right here. What would you say? That would be unacceptable because you'd have no way of holding any measure of accountability. Why do we do that for ourselves? We, do that, we, we, we don't create blueprints for ourselves because we actually don't want to hold ourselves accountable to living a bigger life. We know we can abdicate and live that smaller life if we don't because we can shape shift. We can always say that thing, I really didn't want that anyway. And then ultimately transfer to our kids and say, oh, it's just, I, I, I'm, I'm actually really doing this to help my son. I know I'm not really living my purpose, but my purpose is now that of a parent, so I'm going to make sure. But the thing is, the problem is they're seeing you not live yours, and they're just going to repeat you. <laughs> They'd be much better off seeing you go to Italy and learn Italian and smash grapes because you love Italian wine. And they're going to say, wow, my parent is dynamic and interesting rather than you abdicating and not holding yourself accountable and living with the level of energy that's required to actually live dynamically. So, a blueprint is the first step. Most of us don't want to do it. I would hope that tonight when you go home, just sketch out a blueprint. No, it's completely modifiable. You're not committing to anything, but at least you have a blueprint for your life. One thing I do is I do my blueprints. I do them, and, and I always don't match them, but, but the beautiful thing about blueprints is that it allows you to have a check-in moment about decision-making and to see if your decisions are in line with that blueprint. And it also allows you to check in to see if the scope of what you want to accomplish is actually big enough. Because oftentimes, if we're just kicking around day to day, we don't realize that we're actually living a smaller life than we were meant to live. So, blueprint is number one. Second step, which Will have mentioned, thank God, foundation building. I believe the size and thickness of the foundation is directly proportional to the size and scope of your goals and dreams. That's why when, when I'm walking around New York City and, and you see this tall building going up, usually they dig really, really deep to go up high. Why? Because they need a very deep, big foundation to hold up a building that's tall, right? Or else it would be off kilter. I would suggest the same to you. If you have big goals, big dreams, you need a continually reinforced thick foundation in the area of education, in the area of family, faith, resources, access to resources, a network, all the things that are foundational for building a life. Yet most of us stop with our foundation building. And we stop within our insular circles, and, and we stop that continuing education program. We stop learning new things from new people and meeting new things, meeting new people, going to new places. We stop our foundation build, and then we feel we can't understand why we're stuck. If you maxed out your foundation, you can't build any bigger. You have to continue to build it. Third step. In, in this building process is your framework. That goes on top of the foundation. I would suggest to you that the framework or the analogy here for being active architects of our own lives are the choices that we make. The choices that we make are, 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 are so important because you can actually have a great blueprint, have built a great foundation, and make poor sets of choices, and it takes you off your path. I mean, Tiger Woods is a great example of that, right? And then he made a whole different set of choices, and now he's come back because he had foundation. Right? So you can always come back, but the point is, is that your choices are critical. And I would suggest to you that most of us are making the choice to live with too little energy. Right? Because it's hard to live with energy. Why? What, what makes it hard to live with energy? What makes it hard to live with energy is not the energy itself. It's the fact that the mass tries to bring you back to them. They want to bring you back to the mean because they're like, yo, man, that's not how we do it around here. People say that in, at work all the time to people. They, hey, that, I want to do it this way. No, that's not the way it's done here. Why? You got institutional racism here, right? We got all these other problems, sexism, this, this, this. We have all of these things. I want to change that. It takes a high level of energy to actually change institutions, to change the way things have been done because Folks want to bring people back. Folks want to make people quiet. They want to shut you up. They want to keep you down. Ultimately, because when you challenge them, they have to look at themselves differently, look at themselves in the mirror. Right? So your choices are critical. The fourth and final step of being an active architect of your own life, 
I'm going to ask a question. Now, now, this is good. I want you, the first person to yell out this answer gets a prize. Now, I just want to tell you, I'm going to give you a hint of what the prize could be. On the one hand, the prize could be a brand new, brand new iPhone 10 with Morgan Freeman as Siri. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, it could just be a firm handshake or something in the middle. But whoever gets this right is going to get a prize. The fourth and final piece of being an active architect of your own life is the answer to this question. What is one small thing that every architect designs in, into their structure that's essential for the structure to fulfill its purpose? The, the, hold on. I heard the answer. Roof. I said a small thing. How's a roof small? I heard it over here first. It was a man's voice. A door. Thank you. Come over here, brother. Hey, you got, his, you got his iPhone? Now tell me, why is the door one small thing that, that every architect designs their structure as essential to structure fill its purpose? For people to get in and out. Yes, thank you. So a door does two things. A door lets people in. And I would suggest to you that most of us in our lives have to aggressively let new people, new ideas, new information into our lives. Doors also let people out. And I would suggest to you that we have, all have people in our lives that we need to aggressively get out of our lives. And those are people, those are people that project fear onto you, that tell you what you can't do, to tell you how hard it is to do something, to tell you don't do this. Fear projection is one of the number one things that's debilitating because if you're in a circle where people are projecting fear. Now for me, fear stands for false evidence appearing real. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear seems real because it's tangible and we can feel it, but it's actually not real. It's created. You've inherited 99% of your fears from somebody else in some way you don't even know. It could be gender-based, race-based. It could be about where you live. It could be about how much money you got. It could be about your job. It could be about whatever you watch in the news. Point is, you've inherited the fear. Most of it's irrational and wrong, right? It's just not true. And people project it onto us all the time. So if you find yourself in a circle where you're having fear projection, you have to let those people go. You have to let them out the door because you won't be able to amass the energy required to make that significant change and shift that you need to. Now, people will say to me, Hill, what you're talking about is self-development, personal development. What does this have to do with Dr. King? It has everything to do with Dr. King. Because Dr. King's whole emphasis was on creating dynamic, healthy communities for everybody. And to the extent that we live smaller lives, we are holding our communities back. I need you guys to win. I need you to create that new company that creates more jobs for us. I need you to get on that board of this other company that actually, so you can be a voice at the table. I need you to start that new organization so we can have seats at the table and our voice be heard. I need you to outwork, outperform, out idea. I need you to be creative and dynamic so that you provide opportunity. If you keep living small, you can't provide it. I need my son to have an opportunity. I need you to show him how he can do that. I need him to know that you existed so he can say, I want to be like her. But if her never happens, how can he do it? If the only image he sees is LeBron, then how can he aspire to be anything else than a basketball player? I had a huge speech today for 4,000 kids in L.A. at the Staples Center for the L.A. Clippers. And you all know who owns the L.A. Clippers, right? Steve Ballmer, he was CEO of Microsoft right here from 2000 to 2014. And I tried to break down to these kids because they all said they wanted to be ballers. And I said, isn't it interesting that the guy who owns the team who pays the ballers is a billionaire? And you don't want to aspire to be him? You'd rather bounce the ball and get paid by him? No. The point is, 
is if they don't see someone that kind of looks like them in some kind of way that they can kind of be, how can they ever decide to do it? I got into a big fight with Ken Chenault one time. Ken Chenault was the CEO and chairman of American Express. And I said, Ken, he also went to Harvard Law School. He was a number of years ahead of me. And he and I were getting an award at the same place at the same time. And he, he knew that I'd bring him up in speeches sometimes because I had a bone to pick with him. Because in my speech to young brothers, I say, what y'all want? They man, I want that paper, dog. I want to make that money. I said, what if I told you about somebody who's living right now, who's a black man, who if I took every rapper, living or dead, added up their bank account, every rapper, living or dead, added up their net worth, they couldn't match his stock holdings and net worth. They were like, that N-word don't exist. Or I said, oh, he exists. Oh, he does. His name is Ken Chenault. He's the CEO and chairman of American Express. They said, who? And it broke my heart. You know why? Because that's just as much Ken Chenault's fault as it is them. Ken Chenault needs to be more aggressive in letting people know he's actually there. Yet, it's more comfortable for him to sit in boardrooms and become a black billionaire, and nobody knows it. Because most of the people who works were very conservative. So, oh, no, don't go speak at Howard. Don't go show up in the hood. Don't say, listen, I am Ken Chenault, the richest N-word in the fuck, well, whatever. I know, Lord, 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 Lord. Lord, save me, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Save me. Anoint, anoint me with the blood, Jesus. Oh, goodness. Oh, my goodness. So... He and I got into it a little bit because no one really challenges him ever. And I said, how can these young brothers aspire to be you if they don't even know you exist? You're not a unicorn. So, I was simply asking him to use more energy, to go out of his comfort zone. He's comforted in, in, in boardrooms on Wall Street, but he's not comfortable in bed sty in the hood. But that's where he needs to be seen. So I'm asking you all, as, as we close out, I'm asking you, where do you need to be seen? And can you be radical in your energy to be seen there? Do you need to start that new business that some tech company that actually you become the, the young black Zuckerberg? You're on the cover of Inc. magazine so young brothers and young sisters can say, I want to be like him. I want to be like her. I want to walk around in my chucks and my little hoodie and I want to be a billionaire because I created that app called Who Dat? Is your purpose to work for a major corporation so that you can provide a lane and opportunity? Is your purpose to run for office so you can actually can control the wheels of political power? Is your purpose to, 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 to say, hey, I'm going to start a family and I'm going to raise the most dynamic and interesting and incredible young people in this family. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to instill fear in them. One of the biggest lessons I've learned of being a new parent is that I've always, you go to these playgrounds and and, and, and all you hear is fear projection. Stop, don't, can't, get off. And I've had to check myself mentally. I don't do that with my son. I encourage him to do stuff. And people say, you're crazy. You, he's going to break something. He probably will break many things. But at least he won't be afraid. I tell him he can jump off that thing. He can climb up that thing. I try to get him to do something. He's like, I don't want to do that. I want to make sure I'm raising someone who is fearless. And so I, I, I attempt to practice what I preach. I attempt to live with big energy. I attempt to magnify that energy and, and share it with folks. And I just want you guys to live your truth because the truth is undefeated. If you get to your truth, you can't lose. If you get to your truth, take, start peeling the masks away. Get to that truth. And, 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 and here's the key in. Here's the key, key, key in. 
The word courage is my favorite word in the English language. And the reason why the etymology of the root of the word courage, if you speak French, you know it, it's core. Most people think courage is the antithesis of fear. It's not. Courage is core, which means heart. All courage is is getting into your heart, getting out of your head. I don't care what you've learned and who you learned it from. It doesn't matter. Get into this. When you hear sister sing, it brings you into your heart. It gets you out of your head, right? That's, the, that's where the magic lies. And whatever tool you need to use to get into that space, whether it's music, whether, whether it's meditation or prayer, whether it's reading, whether it's just running or exercise or what, or just sitting there and creating, whatever it gets you into your heart, get in there more because we need you there. We need you to feel passionate about something and then act accordingly. So the other thing that I do, and this is just one thing I'll share about staying in that space, and this is how we're going to close out, is that I use affirmations. It wasn't until I went to Hollywood that I realized why people have entourages. <laughs> they have entourages to have people whisper in your ear how good and great you are to keep your energy up, to keep your confidence up. You know, you're about to walk in and they were, man, Whitney, you the best. <laughs> you're unstoppable. Problem is those same people don't check you when you're doing drugs and other things. So. That's a whole different, that's a different talk. We'll do that next year. Um, but affirmations you can do for yourself because it's easy to get pulled off track because there's so many things that happen to us. We have to have something to, to write us back to that confidence place, that energy place that says, I can do this. I can wake up dynamically. You could use podcasts. You can use Instagram. Doesn't, this is one I use. And just say this with me, please, with a little vocal energy. I will not. A little more vocal energy because we actually have to get used to speaking a little louder. I want us to get used to amplifying our voices in rooms and in meetings. I want people to start saying, why are they talking so loud now? They used to be quiet in the meetings. Excuse me. Excuse me. Hello. Yes. If you work at Starbucks, can I take your order, please? What do you want? What's your name? They'll be like, why is they talking so loud? Because I need you to be energized. I will not, I will not allow, fear allow fear to stop me, to stop me from making the choices making the that I already know I should make. Instead, I will act with courage with my heart, and I will win at my life. And in so doing, I will give others permission to win as well. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Phil Harper. Phil Harper. So we did promise you just a few minutes on a little questions and answers. So we're going to do a little Q&A. And I'm going to give him a chance to catch his breath. Now many of you know for the last 11 years, I've been the technology chair of the city, amongst other things. And we are filming this with Seattle Channel. So it's part of our uh, permanent uh, archives in Seattle Channel. So I, I have to read this. Uh, my name is Bruce Harrell. And the views and words expressed by our speaker are not endorsed by this channel. <laughs> Okay, I don't want to get those emails tomorrow. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I don't, and, and the other thing is, we have, and I want to recognize if they are still here, there's a project at the University of Washington, the Seattle Civil Rights Labor and History Project, where many of you know Seattle, and you know that the, the struggles that we are faced with now in the 50s and 60s, my grandfather came here from Louisiana in the, in the 40s, many of the folks, uh, the, the struggles, that were made, that we are beneficiaries of what they went through and what they fought for. And this project in the University of Washington is honoring and has interviewed over 80 folks, civil, right, civil rights leaders in this region, and are commemorating them. And so it's in your program, and I just want to know if there are any of those 
honorees of that project here. I don't know, are there any here? I would ask that you stand so we could leave, give, give you a hand right now. Are there any of the honorees here? I don't, I don't, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to take just a, a couple of questions, and I will, uh, uh, I may need a little help because I'm going to give Hill perhaps, I know you got the energy, but you may have to harness that energy right here for the moment. Are, the, are these mics on? Yes. yes. And then I'll, I'll, I'll bring the mic out. Is that the, okay, you'll do it. Thank you very much. Just raise your hand and we'll come to you. If you have, if you have a question. All right, how you doing, Harper? Hey, brother. All right, my name's Terry Hill. I was in prison for the ninth time when I read your book. All right, it inspired me to finish this one, and I would like you to have it. Wow. All right. Yeah. So I put it. I, I put a. Hey, man, put, you got to sign it for me. Uh, well, I. I just wanted to make sure that I had permission to give it to you. Oh, come on. Right. Your yeah. last name is Hill. We cousins. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to admit, you have good talk. Oh, thank yeah. you. Got a Hi, Hill. <laughs> Hi, Hill. Um, <clears throat> when you wrote the book, Letters to a Young Brother, and then Letters to a Young Sister, I had a rites of passage program for young people. And we used the books mm. in our program. But that's not the reason why I'm here. I wrote to you in an email. And I was very angry because I didn't get anything back. Did you I write it to the email that's the email in the book? No. What email did you write it to? Oh, the email in the book? The email in the book. Yes. Okay. That's the only thing that I had. Yeah. But the publishing company shut down that email that was in the book. Yes. Um, I, I figured that, Hill. And I'm not mad at you. I okay? Uh, no explanation needed. No, no, I'm just having <laughs> you. Just tell me that. Okay. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is the energy that you talked about tonight. Because I could have sat up and been upset about that, and well, I was okay. Yeah. For a short period. I of think time. you need to write an angry letter to Penguin <laughs> Books. <laughs> but, but I used that energy that I got. I used all of that energy to create in me a foundation mm. to teach those kids about how to let go of their anger, mm. how to move forward. So I thank you for not, not, not just, I thank Penguin Books or whatever the name of the book was, but go ahead. I thank you for, for taking your energy to start a Rites of Passage program, to find books that could speak to young people, to get them and encouraging them to read. Um, that level of leadership and that le level of connected tissue mm -hmm is vital, it's yes. so important. And, and so I thank you for doing that. I yes. celebrate you for doing that. Thank and you. we created, what's so funny is in the, if you look at the book, we created this email address at Letters to a Young Brother, Letters to a Young Sister. And Penguin, the book company, got sold to, to uh, Random House. Okay. And when Random House came over, they didn't care about yeah some emails from a book, and they just shut down all those emails because they, you know, legally they had to go through them and then forward to me. But what's so amazing is I did get thousands and thousands of hard letters, particularly from young men and young women that were incarcerated, and that's how the whole program started happening because judges would assign the book, uh, and, and, you know, and I felt some kind of way about it. I was like, so my book is a penalty? I mean, that's messed up. Mm -hmm. But... Um, but thank you for creating a program, and thank you for what you, you've, you've already done, um, because that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So here, Where? right here. Oh, here. Oh, there. Thank Hi. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for praying first that it gave you the courage to step all over our toes and slap us in the face. I appreciate that. Mm. So um, 
my question to you is that the blueprint, I wrote all four of them down. Right. Um, some people have ideas that they have to sometimes do like, uh, like when you're playing double dutch, jump in and snatch them out because your mind is full of so many things. Mm -hmm. So in, in writing the blueprint, seriously, um, when you have so many places where you see yourself, how do you start to make the blueprint? I think it's a great question. I call it sequential mastery. And so w the, the way one has to look at it is that one of the worst sayings I believe ever is don't be a jack of all trades and a master of none. I think that we all have the capacity to be masters of many things, but we have to do it in, se in, in certain sequence. So if you have a lot of different things that you want to do, the first thing that one should, you, you, as you're making your blueprint, is you decide, foundationally speaking, if I complete this one first, does it actually help me or set me up with this other one that I want to do, right? So it's all about sequential mastery. How do I build upon it? If I, if I want to accomplish this, 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 and this, how do I set this up in an order to build through such that it makes each next step a little bit easier? Um, so... There's a number of people out there, young people I meet, that want to be YouTube stars, right? And then you say, well, what, what, are, you, what are you gonna talk about? What are you passionate about? And, and so just saying you want to be a YouTube star is fine, right? But if you break down, if you just do a little research, the people who are YouTube stars, they usually talk about something specific, right? So my suggestion with a lot of those young people is they first identify what you're actually passionate about. If you're passionate about Alf, <laughs> the, the puppet, Alf, way back. That's fine, because I believe you could triple down on Alf and start to find an audience, right? So it doesn't matter what it is, but you have to identify that thing first, build off that, and then do the other things. Does that make sense? And so it's sequential mastery. Thank you. Over here. Yes. Hill, first I want to thank you for giving such an inspirational speech, but I'd like, to, uh, I'd like for you to share with this audience how you met Barack Obama. Okay. He knows this story. It's Michael. Um, you know, he's one of Seattle's leaders in the community. He's really the reason I'm, 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 I'm here and uh, uh, in, in have so much respect for him. You know, it was the second day of class at Harvard Law School, and I wanted to play basketball. Those of you who've seen the movie He Got Game, you know I'm a very good basketball player. Because I, you know, why, I don't know why you're laughing. Y'all don't even have an NBA team here. Watch it here, watch it. Uh, sorry, sorry. I hate to bring up old wounds. Have y'all done your psychotherapy healing over losing that team? The Sonic Pelican, Grizzly, I don't know, where did they go? Memphis? Are they the Sonic? Oklahoma. Oklahoma, oh, the Sonic Thunder. Wow. But don't worry, you got a hockey team coming. <laughs> But that means if a basketball team's coming soon. For real, it's coming, so that's good. I'm excited. But I will be gone by the time they're here. Um, so it's the second day of class, I wanted to play basketball. I walk into the gym and, and the gym is empty and, and I, was, I was disappointed because it's always more fun to play with folks. And the interesting thing about being at Harvard Law School, the library is full but the gym is empty, imagine that. And so I was there playing and, and just as I was about to leave, in walked this tall skinny guy his socks were put up a little too high, his shorts were a little too small. And, and I ran up to him, I said, hey man, you wanna play basketball? And he looked down at me and said, why else would I be in the gym? I was like, man, you don't know me, I will cut you. I said, what's your name? He says, my name's Barack, and I, and I met Barack. And what's interesting is I looked up to him, and not just because he's taller than me, I, I looked up to him because he had a sense of purpose and gravitas. I was just 21 years old, coming right out of Brown University, going straight to grad school. He was almost 30. 
Uh, he had spent seven years after college as a community organizer in Chicago. He had all this social justice credibility and he was going back to school at almost 30 years old. And if you think about that real quick, so many of us are surrounded by people who talk us out of making life-shifting decisions like that. In fact, you can imagine the conversations folks said, man, man, you're almost 30 years old. You've been working a job that pays $13,000 a year. You don't have any money. You're going to have to go into a significant amount of debt to go to grad school. You should go to some local community spot. Don't go to Harvard. Who are you to dream so big? Who are you to take out student loans to, to pursue your dream? You're almost 30, man. You should be starting a family already. You're way behind. You could just start to hear the mantra, right? If you have a bigger plan and you feel like your foundation requires a bigger foundation, then that's on you to build it. So he decides to go back to school at almost 30 years old, and he had a presence or a gravitas that, that was commensurate with that decision. He wasn't there for idle time and chit-chat. He wasn't there to just hang out and say, what am, kick around, what am I gonna do? And this is what's so interesting about it, is that as he went through law school, he became the president of the, the law review, which is the highest position as a student in the school. And most presidents of the law review become Supreme Court clerks, because that's the next high position that you get. And most people believe, why do something if you're not gonna take the next best thing that comes from it? In other words, we, we're aspirational in that sense. We say, oh, you do this to do this, rather than just doing this just to do it. He turned down all those offers because he wanted to write a book. And people looked at him sideways and said, yo, man, you're just graduating grad school. Who are you to write a book? What do you got to say? He wanted to write a book. And, and what's interesting, when that book came out, no one bought it. But what did it do? Now watch this, this is when I talk about blueprint. This is a master blueprint maker. At that time, there was a lot of stigma around drug use. He put in his book, he knew where he was going, see? And he knew that if he outed himself early, then it's a non-story 20 years later when he's running for political office. You see what I'm saying? You have to have made a blueprint to know to do that. So copying to the, someone says, you use cocaine. Man, that's an old story. It's been in my book for 20 years. It becomes non-news. I mean, now we have a president that's a, a rapist, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> you could do anything these days, huh? You collude with the Russian president and actually work for that government. Okay, I won't get you in trouble in Zion Church. What's your 11111 Harvard Street? I know. Listen, you said you're not running for re-election, so you can say anything you want. But at the end of the day, we met that second day of school, and he's impressed me every step of the way because not only did he live with the level of energy that I talked about time and time again, he also lived with a real plan. You think marrying Michelle was happenstance? He knew that he needed someone smarter than him to get there. He also knew he needed someone that would pay the bills. Sister's always telling me, I want to find someone who's equally yoked. She carried him for 12 years. Date somebody who has potential, not who's already there. I, 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 I'm, if I keep talking, I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, this is going to conclude our program. Can we give Hill one more warm round of applause? I love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming out. This concludes our program. Thank you for being here in Unity Day.